my wife and I got into real estate and started, you know, jumping into the education and trying to learn um, what we could do. It was probably like the worst timing in our marriage ever to mm. do that. We just had our third kid. Welcome to How to Real Estate Podcast, a podcast to help you start, elevate, and catapult your real estate investing career. Don't forget to like, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on any new podcasts that we post every single Monday. Jared tested. Jenna approved. Hey, welcome to How To Real Estate Podcast. Uh, this is Jared. And Jenna. We, today we have um, our guest today is a full-time investor and agent in Salt Lake, um, actually in the South Ogden uh, Weaver area, right? Um, before he did real estate, though, he struggled to make about $60,000 a year, and now he's able to do that, uh, make that amount of money in a month, right? You've had a few transactions like that, right? Yes, we've had a few months where we've made that much in a month. That's a lot. Like going from 60000 a year, or trying to attempt to go to sixty to make that in a month, and that's all through real estate investing, or? Correct. Yeah, between and my agent commissions and also between my investing transactions. Wow. So what did you do before you got into real estate? Uh, so I actually worked in a production facility that was a part of uh, the LDS Church Welfare Program. And so I was working with the machinery to package food for people that were in need. It's called the Welfare System, Welfare Program, but it actually helped people that were all over the world that were in need, whether it was people just in a rough financial situation or you know, in, they've just gone through a hurricane or some kind of catastrophe. And, they're basically without food and water, and the church steps in to help cover oh, that nice. out. So, uh, our guest's name, by the way, is Devin Hubbard. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the podcast, man. I really appreciate you coming by. Thank you. Uh, take time of your day to, to to share your wisdom and knowledge with uh, with everyone. So, you've been investing for five years, right? Yes, my wife and I got started. We made the decision in August of 2014 to get into real estate. Nice. What made you make that decision? Was it <clears throat> was it you or was it like so with with the spouse? You brought your wife, so uh, a lot of times it's, it's one that kind of pushes the other. So, I mean, whose idea was it to actually jump into this? Uh, it was always mine, <laughs> <laughs> with the support of my wife. But uh, you know, I I started going to college after serving a mission and went to Costa Rica for two years and just got home and, and started working a full-time job and going to school on the side just because that's what I thought I was supposed to do. That's what society required of me. And I had always had that desire to get out of that rat race or get out of that um, position, but I never knew how until I really started learning about real estate and what opportunities and possibilities there were outside of just a W-2 type job. So um, yeah, in August of 2014, my wife and I both made, made the decision to buy into a real estate education uh, group, and that definitely opened our minds. Um, we, of course, I'm sure everybody mentions Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. We read that, and that obviously opens up your mind to what what's really possible and <clears throat> what's uh, what's doable outside of you know just the safe, secure nine to five job that I thought I needed to do but didn't really want to do. If that makes sense. No, makes perfect sense. Well, we're 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 taught that since we're little, you gotta have to have your ninety-five job and then work forty years, forty hours a week, and then live on forty percent of your income. I forgot right. when you when you retire. But yeah, that didn't sound like fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that, I'll, I'll be honest too that I was the first one in my household to go to college. Okay. I I did get my associate's degree, and my my wife and I both agreed once I got my associate's degree that that was enough. <laughs> but knowing that I always wanted to be in the business and in the real estate, we both agreed. Finishing my associate's degree, that was enough, and to focus on real estate full time at that point. That's awesome. So uh, once you get your, your associate's degree and you're you're working, um, when you started real estate, did you jump in real estate like full time from the get go, or how did you how did that progression work? No, so I was still working my nine to five for about three years as as I transitioned into real estate. Um, we bought a rental was the first thing we did and I realized $300 a month in cash flow. I was like, man, I'm going to have to get a lot of houses making $300 a month to even like walk away from my job if I was going to go that direction. And of course there's, there's many different ways you can do it, but a single family home cash flowing $300 a month wasn't very exciting, especially uh, knowing that 15 months later that I was going to have to sell the property because I was sick of being the landlord. <laughs> I learned my lesson that I'm not a good landlord. so. Uh, the properties that I have now, I've hired a property manager 
And so anyway, the first deal we did was a rental property and then we got into flipping and wholesaling and it's just kind of snowballed into all sorts of different real estate transactions over the years. So that's awesome. Yeah. So it took you three years to, so once you, so you, you bought your flip or not, you have your, 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 your rental, mm-hmm. you're, you're managing it yourself. So yep. when the GI Joe was stuck in the toilet, they, they were calling you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, and so, uh, did, uh, did the next transaction was it was it started getting the flips or did you continue on the rental train or what did you do? You know, there's I always had the desire to do a flip, yeah. and there's a lady that actually had passed away in my neighborhood, and I was like, man, this is the perfect opportunity. She was a widow, and I knew that the home was dated. It was a good home, but it just it needed some work. So I thought maybe this might be the perfect opportunity to pick up a uh, fix and flip. So I literally just wrote a hand letter. And on my way to work, I dropped it off in the mailbox and went on my way to work. And within the same day I dropped it off, I got a phone call from one of the sons wow. that had inherited the property, said we're interested in selling and when can you come look at it? So I, we immediately made an appointment to go look at it. They wanted a specific number and I told them they wanted about 125 at this point. This was probably about two and a half, three years ago. Yeah. And I said the best I can do was like 110. And I just kind of left that offer on the table and they said, well, we'll think about it. And they wanted to get more for it, which I understood. Everybody does. Mm -hmm. And I just said, well, I'll leave that offer on the table. If you change your mind, let me know. But in order for me to get the numbers to work, this is kind of where I need to be. And he called back a few weeks later and said, are you still interested? And I said, of course. I said, can we just look at the property one more time? So we ended up walking it one more time. We actually came into an agreement to buy it for 105. And so we did, we bought it for 105 and um, ended up putting about 20 into it and sold it for 166. We had it under contract for 170, it appraised for 166, Mm. which hurt because that's, you know, four grand out of your pocket. But um, within 90 days, yeah, from the time we purchased it to the time we closed on it and sold it, it was less than 90 days. And our net profit was $26,000. And that was a game changer for us. Yeah, Yeah, that was almost at that time, that was almost half of my 12 months of income in just on a side hustle, you know, one right. little project within 90 days. And so that that really gave us that belief that this we can do this, okay. like, yeah. That's and, crazy that it went from 110 um, to 105. So they ended up calling you weeks later and they actually got less than- what They wanted original. 110 and when we walked it again, I just said, is there any way that we can do 105? And he called his brother, There, it was two brothers that were the executors on the trust. And uh, he called his brother and came back within just a matter of minutes and he said, yeah, we can do 105. Wow. We closed on it pretty quick. The cool thing is my hard money lender agreed to give us 100% of the purchase price. And wow. at the time he said, I, I'll, I'll actually give you $7,000 if you want to wholesale it to me. And I was tempted and he said, but, and this is how I knew I had a good hard money lender. He actually said, but I want you to do it because I know you can make a lot more money if you flip it yourself. So I was like, okay, this guy has my back wow. and that's a guy that I can trust. So anyway, yeah, he, he gave us the full purchase price and, um, yeah, we ended up making twenty six. So yeah, I'm glad we glad we flipped it ourselves <laughs> instead of wholesaling it for seven thousand. So yeah. So did you use a general contractor, or did you sub all the all the stuff out? It was pretty minor things. Um, so yeah, we just had I just had local friends and um, connections that did a lot of the flooring and paint, updated fixtures and countertops and stuff. So it wasn't anything super major that we had to to update. Luckily. That's cool. So, so you said you dropped off. You just hand out. And just did you put the letter in the actual deceased or the the, the subject property's house, or did you look up who the who the heirs were? Or how did you? So it was actually a lady that I knew. For, she actually I went to church with this lady, uh-huh. so I'd known her for years and years. And once I heard she had passed away, I had no idea what the plans were with it. But I figured it's a good opportunity to to maybe buy buy a property to fix and flip, knowing the condition of the home. It was built in like the early to mid 50s and I don't think they'd updated a thing since the day it was built. <laughs> so it, uh, like the funny thing is one of the sons told us we could just restretch the carpet when we were going to fix it up. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so it's just a totally different mindset but yeah we, we ended up just tearing everything out. We kept uh, we kept a lot of the same, you know it's a good solid brick home but we updated uh, all the fixtures, countertops um, and tile and different things so all the flooring and paint and stuff we updated. and, and yeah, so we put about 20000 into it, which nowadays that would probably be closer to 30000 for that same deal just because of the cost of materials and labor nowadays. But. Oh, sure. Absolutely. 
So it sounds like you started, um, when you left that job that you had, you started investing. And at what point then did you get your real estate license? So, good question. Um, having done a handful of flips and different deals, I realized even though I had agents that were giving me a pretty decent deal um, with their commissions, they still seemed to be the one negotiating some of the deals or working with some of the, even the buying agents, having uh, relationships with some of the buying agents, knowing the situation. And so I just realized I was leaving a lot of money on the table, not being an agent myself. And then I, um, a lot of friends and families and acquaintances coming to me, knowing, knowing that that was in real estate, but not really realizing that I wasn't an agent. So they would ask me, hey, I'm looking to buy or sell. Can you help me? And at that point, I was just like, man, I, I can't, but this guy can. And so at that point, it's, I just decided it was a good decision to get my real estate license and it would just be a good bonus to have with what I was doing. And I'm actually really glad I did. It's opened a lot of doors for me as far as being able to network. A lot of my deals come from other agents because so many agents have that kind of tunnel vision where they just focus on their commissions. Right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these opportunities come their way, but they don't know what to do with it. So I actually will gladly have them represent me as the buyer, even though I'm an agent. If they bring me the deal, I'll tell them, hey, you represent me as the buyer, and that way you can get Your a commission yeah. for bringing me a deal. So I've actually had quite a few deals work out that way by other agents bringing me deals. So even as an agent, even as an agent, you were able to uh, have have it find those those well you can't say pocket listings anymore but uh, they bring you deals and, and they would even represent you even though you're an agent but you did that to mostly this motivation for them to bring deals to you right correct that's awesome yeah. yeah it's been good it's been a good way to get quite a bit of business so. yeah I bet I bet yeah mm. so is that the main focus on how you find deals is this through uh, other uh, agents or and or through war market or do you have other Methods was that that's that is that your bread and butter? Yeah, that's, that's right honestly that's my bread and butter. I've I've uh, grown up and lived in Weber and Davis County my whole life, yeah. and so you know my sphere of influence, my warm market, most of my connections are all Weber Davis County, and so I'd say ninety percent of my deals are all within those two counties. That's awesome. So, right. So uh, I mean, how do you uh, do? You just so how do you get those agents to find deals to you, or bring deals to you? Are you, are you just trying to talk to as many agents as you can, or is it just within your own brokerage? Or what, um, are, what are you doing to get them? You know, being in real estate and being, I go to a lot of networking meetings and different things, and so I guess just over building up over the last five years, I've been able to come across it. Between networking meetings, um, social media, and different things, people know what I'm doing, and so um, there's a lot of people that either reach out to me with deals or wanting to learn what I'm doing, and so there's, I go out to lunch with people all the time, which I enjoy. Yeah, for but, sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I enjoy connecting with people, and ultimately that's what real estate comes down to, is relationships, mm -hmm. and so that's that's definitely what drives me, is I'm a, definitely a people person, and so I guess real estate is just kind of a side gig with, yeah. with all the relationships there, but yeah, the passion, the passion is real estate and for sure the people. Right. So. And what, so you've been an agent for 18 months now. Can you, I mean, I don't know if you, what's the percentage of actual, so out of the transactions you've done in the last 18 months, mm -hmm. would you say the percentage of, of actually just acting as an agent and helping people out, like signing or, or listing or, or, or buying a house, as opposed to doing your own deals? Is, is most, are you still focusing mostly on your deals? Or how much, what's the percentage? Um, I would say it's probably about 70, 30. 70% 70 is probably mostly my own deals and 30% agent. Um, but I'd actually kind of like to get that probably closer to 50, 50. Yeah. Um, a little bit more consistency with the agent stuff. Sure. And yeah, just help drive the investing that much more. But yeah, I'd like to keep it about 50, 50. Awesome, cool. So, um, so what, uh, how has it been, how has it like, when you're doing wholesales or flips, has being an agent helped or deterred some of this out? Because there's certain things that, as an agent we have to, we have to disclose we're an agent, we're talking to right. people. And so, I mean, um, what, is some, what are some of the pros and cons of being an investor and an agent? Um, I've actually, you know, again, there's this the disclosure, the paperwork, a few extra hoops to jump through that way. But my broker actually recommends and asks that we don't wholesale or assign contracts. And so I've just double closed on everything. Okay. So, which, you know, in the end, it costs a little bit more in, in closing costs and, and, and paying hard money lenders for uh, to borrow their money for a short time frame. But 
Um, right. It keeps it a little bit cleaner and keeps everybody happy. Sure. So that just to just to make him happy and and it actually a lot of times too, what we've what we've done is when we do a deal with somebody, um, we'll typically say we'll close on this date and we'll give you up to two weeks to move out after you've got your money. That way you've got your money and you can take what you want, leave behind what you don't want. And that way there's no real excuse for them to not be able to leave. But sometimes people have that issue where they've got their money and then they end up squatting. And so um, we'll usually put anywhere from five to $10,000 in an escrow account. And that way, once they're out within those 14 days, we release those funds out of that mm -hmm. escrow account. And that way they have incentive. They've already got their money, but then they get that extra five or $10,000 that we hold back in an escrow account to incentivize them to be out within the first 14 days after we close. Gotcha. And has that helped uh, your close rate? Like telling like, hey, I'll give an extra two weeks. I mean, how's that? Yeah, I'd say the last two deals that we've done, um, they haven't even talked to anybody else. These were just kind of off market deals. Yeah. And uh, they actually, both of them were, were, were referrals, just word of mouth and they closed with us. Just, we got one contract signed within 24 hours of meeting them. And the second one was we met them that same day and, and had the contract written up within probably an hour or two of wow. just meeting them. That's awesome. So, and my deals have been working with these people for like six months. I swear. Yeah, well, <laughs> and that's that's those. There's definitely those two, but yeah, every once in a while you get those yeah. those ones that are just they're ready to go yesterday. So. Yeah, yep, yeah, no, hundred percent. That's awesome, man. So, uh, for those you mentioned double close. So for a lot, of, a lot of our listeners and people that are watching on YouTube. I mean, what is what is double close? Walk us through that whole. So process. that just means that we will get a repsy or real estate purchase contract signed. I will close on it myself with my entity, and then I will turn around and sell it to an end buyer, whether that's somebody that wants to live in the house or a flipper or somebody that wants to turn it into a rental. So basically, I'm closing on it myself, and then I'm turning turning around and selling it to an end buyer and closing on it with them. So and so, what's the time frame? As a, do you do you, like the same day those those two transactions happen, or what? What's that look like? Um, usually, it's within two to three weeks. Oh, okay. So it's sometimes it's been within a matter of days, um, but the the last few that we've done, it's been two to three weeks. Okay. So so you put it in the, so you you basically buy it with the hard money lenders or with with pri or hard and private money lenders, mm -hmm. and then two to three weeks you find a buyer. So how, do you just market like you would normally like as, as an agent? Or how do you, how are you marketing it to? Uh, just to through just through other connections. Yeah. You know, over five years, you get quite a few buyers and yeah. people. And uh, sometimes I'll even um, partner with other wholesalers that have quite a bit of a buyers list. Yeah. And so I'll, like I've partnered with other wholesalers, and they'll throw it out on their cash buyers list, and then they'll just take a little bit of a cut. But one of the deals we've done recently, we did that, and we just did a seventy thirty split, and it was beneficial for both of us. Sure. So yeah. If you're one of my list, let me know. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> Anytime. No, oh, that's awesome. So do you start uh, marketing it once you get on your contract so you can so you it would get closed up tied um, up all sooner or, or wait till you close? Yeah, usually sometimes I'll just put some feelers out once I've got it under contract, but uh, usually I'll wait until we've actually closed to mm. really start making it official. Right. So and so do you have, does your hard money lenders and, and do they know that you're planning just to, just to wholesale, just to double close? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So one of the deals we just did back in October, um, my hard money lender actually offered me $25,000 just to basically walk away, just to wholesale it to him basically. Wow. And I knew I could get quite a bit more. So um, he agreed, we came to an agreement on hard money and I knew I'd probably have it sold within the first 30 days. And so um, we just came to terms on basically hard money for 30 days, and we ended up getting almost double that amount from another buyer, so it's pretty good. Oh yeah, <laughs> so, no, sometimes, I don't know, sometimes you learn, sometimes the first offer is the best offer, and sometimes you just kind of have that gut feeling that that's not, you know, don't settle for the first or only offer, so yeah, yeah, we're glad. We, I think we, walk, we walked away with close to 48 on that deal. Wow, that's pretty good. So. And that was like within 30 days you said, right? Yeah, yeah within like two to three weeks. From the time we closed on it, the time we bought it, to the time we sold it, it was probably two, three weeks. That's insane. I mean, when you when you go back to because I was making when I was working hourly, that's about the same as you sixty thousand dollars a year and making almost fifty grand in in, in a couple of weeks. I mean, that's just mind boggling. It is. You know? <laughs> it, it is. It's mind boggling. It's uh, but it makes me makes me glad that you know I, I took that leap of faith five years ago. Because yeah. really, honestly, when my wife and I got into real estate and started 
you know, jumping into the education and trying to learn um, what we could do, it was probably like the worst timing in our marriage ever to mm -hmm. do that. We just had our third kid. I was in between jobs actually, and just uh, um, our second son was two at the time and just broken his femur. So he was in a spike of cast for oh six gosh. weeks and had an ambulance ride to Primary Children's Hospital. So, you know, like all of this was in the middle of it and it was like, hey, do you want to spend, you know, a good chunk of money to start real estate? And I was like, no, but we did it. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes it's not always convenient or easy, but I don't think there's ever going to be an easy or convenient time to, to start something, whether it's real estate or a new career, or, you know, whatever you're passionate about wanting to get do in your life. You know, it's never easy or convenient. There's always something a, in the way. There's it's just a matter of making that decision and then sticking to it. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. And what now when you when you because you, you paid for an education and you, you said at the time you're it's kind of worst worst time ever to mm -hmm. kind of really do it. Was that like a, a motivating factor for you to kind of, I got I gotta, I oh, yeah. to make this work? Right? For sure. Yeah, it was like put your freaking feet to the fire yeah. and make it work because, yeah, we basically maxed out 0% credit cards and I knew that that 0% on credit cards was going to come up and there's a, you know, a deadline on that 0%. And so I, that's the first time we'd ever taken out credit cards in our marriage and uh, but we paid them off before we ever had to pay a dime in any interest. So it's free money, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Cheaper than a student loan. Yeah, no. <laughs> don't even start a student loan. That's incredible. So how how is it? So it's been five years since you took that leap of faith. You know, uh, I mean, uh, it, it does your wife work now, or is she is she stay at home mom? She's a stay at home mom. We have three kids of our own. We have a foster baby that we're oh, cool. looking to adopt in the next few months, hopefully. And uh, my wife is actually pregnant with another boy. So congratulations. We've got yeah. We've got a house full of boys. We've got a daughter and three boys at home and another boy on the way. So, oh, wow. yeah, my it, poor wife is going to be outnumbered. <laughs> <laughs> at, least you have the, at least she has the daughter. The one yes, daughter, yes. so yeah, my wife stays at home. Uh, she's actually an author. She just wrote a book last year, and uh, she's working on a second book now. And uh, she was an educator. She was a first grade and a kindergarten teacher for about six or seven years. Yeah. And uh, real estate has definitely blessed us enough for her to be able to walk away and be That's a awesome. full-time mom. And, pursue other dreams and aspirations that she has. So, um, yeah, it's been good to us. That's incredible. So, I mean, working <clears throat> 95 jobs and then to be in a position where you're able to give the freedom for your, your family, the person you love the most, right, your wife, um, other than the kids, right, but for the person you love the most, um, the freedom to just do whatever she wants. I mean, that, that's, that's incredible. That's, yeah. That's like, uh, that's literally life-changing. Yeah. Right? Just, yep. That's pretty incredible. Yep. Yeah. And uh, we, we, Decided to do real estate full time December of 2017. So it's just been over two years. We've now been doing it full time. Mm -hmm. And at first, I was the one bugging my wife. We got to do this full time. And then in, the, in 2017, we made twice as much in real estate part time as I was making at my full time job. So it was at that point my wife was the one pushing me, like, no, we got to do this full time. You need to quit your W 2. So yeah. she was the one pushing me, which was helpful. And, and did it continue to double as when you're able to put in? The full time hours and into did it seem like it just took off from there or, or? I would say the last <clears throat> it's slowly gone up yeah. you know so um, I've been able to actually spend a lot more time with family and vacationing and doing other things and so I haven't pushed as hard as maybe I could have or should have right. but we've yeah we've made more the last two years than we did then so it's just gradually kept scaling up. That's awesome. And, and there's no race, you know what I mean? So, I mean, if, if the whole purpose was just to get the biggest bank account, but you, you want to be able to provide for your family and have, live so they can live free and then still have time for the family. That's something yeah. I forget to do sometimes. I, yeah. I, I get lost in work sometimes. So quite a bit. Yeah, my wife has actually challenged me because of that same thing. My wife has challenged me, so we both agreed that I'm going to work from home and basically just not work on Fridays. So we're going to stick to four-day work weeks starting nice. this new year and so what well, today's thursday so mm -hmm. today's the end of my work week this week today's your friday yeah, today's, my friday. <laughs> friday. today's my friday so she's understanding you know if i've got clients that need to get into a home or close on a deal or whatever mm -hmm. she's definitely understanding and flexible but yeah for the most part we'll just be spending time together on fridays right that's awesome being in real estate though especially as an agent how have you um how has that been being able or you haven't started you're starting this but uh, there's times when you 
say it's going to be your day off, but then you get calls, you know, or you're, that's the only time that your client can actually go see a home or, or sign paperwork or things like that. Um, how are you going to handle that going forward? That's a good question. Um, so I've actually hired a TC, a transaction mm-hmm. coordinator. And so basically they just charge a flat rate. So anytime I close a deal, they just get paid out of whatever my commission is. Usually it's two to 300 bucks. And so they do a lot of the legwork that takes off of my plate, you know? Yeah. So they do a lot of the paperwork, phone calls, a lot of the logistics. So again, they can't go show home. Well, yeah, I've got to show home or whatever, but um, they that's actually taken a lot off my plate. A lot of the, the paperwork took up a lot of time and frustration on my part. <laughs> I, don't, I hate that part, I'm, I'm the people person. <clears throat> But uh, so yeah, just the hiring a transaction coordinator and something that my broker has actually taught me is I'm the one setting the boundaries, not right. letting the clients set the boundaries. And so I tell them the days and times I'm available and they can decide when, when they can make that work. That's good. I think that's a, a tough one for a lot of new agents, especially they, they, you know, they need the clients, they need the business. And so they'll do pretty much anything to get that business, whether it's showing the house on the holidays or taking calls at midnight, you know, right. you do have to set that boundary, I think, at the beginning of that relationship. So that's, and then hiring um, help too, like the transaction coordinators or, you know, maybe uh, subbing out the work of showing homes or you mm-hmm. know, things like that, that you have to let go sometimes in order, your time is more valuable than, right. than that. So. Yeah, and yeah, knowing that there might be deals that are way out of my area, you know, that mm-hmm. Weaver Davis County or even within 30 to 45 minutes of radius of where I live and work, um, it's always easy. I've got plenty of connections to refer clients out yeah. to other agents that might, you know, that might be their niche market or area. So um, that's always easy too to kind of push it out yeah. to other right. agents. And I think people kind of respect that too. A lot of times, like they're worried about the other person, like, oh, well, they uh, you don't work Saturday as an example, but they can only see the house. They really want to see a house on Saturday, but I think people respect when you late when you are. They may not like it with respect it, if that makes sense, you know, so when, when you're show that you are firm on on your decisions, on, on what, you, what you're willing to accept. Um, your priorities, too. Your priorities, exactly. Like, yeah. hey, this is the time that I have with my family, and, and I'm like, wow, that guy's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Try and. Right, right, right. Yeah. It's, a, it's a juggling act, for mm-hmm. sure, but um, yeah, it's definitely pushing more to, um, yeah, find that more of that balance. Um, one thing I'll share quick too is a friend of mine who actually does the same thing. Um, he's in real estate. He mentioned just the other day that they did half as many real estate transactions or actual flips last year, but they made twice as much money. And wow. he said that instead of just trying to take on any deal that came that might make money, they focused on the best deals. And those were the, the best deals were the ones that they would actually keep and flip themselves instead of trying to tackle any deal that might make you five or ten grand they they focused on the deals that might make them 50 or you know a lot lot more and so that uh, that's something that kind of stood out to me on something that I can focus on this year is not just not just be willing to take any deal or you know get all caught up with my time and energy and emotions on these deals that might make me five or ten grand instead focus on the deals that might make me you know, the 40 or 50 grand. It's kind of like uh, how you were talking about the boundaries. You have your requirements too. And if you stick to those, then you'll get the good deals. Right. Yeah. Not deal with the smaller, yeah. small potatoes. Small <laughs> kinds of yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. So uh, it, it's that 80 20 rule. You know, I mean, you 80% of your, your income is going to be from 20% of your whatever it is. 20% of your deals is going to get 80% of your income. So uh, I've read many books where they suggest to cut out the other. 80% is wasting your time. It's only giving you 20% of your income um, and just focus on the 20 Honestly, that's kind of where the, your, your friend's doing and what you want to kind of go to. It's a, a genius person. Yeah. So uh, tell me, so I'm going to ask you two questions. Okay. Um, what has been your, your, biggest, your biggest success and what has been one of your biggest failures, if you might share? Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, my biggest success would be you know, the, the financial part is great, but I would say the lifestyle that I live now is probably the greatest success, is being able to walk away from what I thought I had to do for 30 or 40 years in that nine to five, and being able to make, you know, just the other day, I thought, geez, it's been two years I've been doing this full time, like, 
Holy smokes. Like it's crazy, right? I made it happen. <laughs> I survived two years being self employed and a business owner and, and not relying on all the other securities and things of a W two or a job a nine to five job. And so I would say that's been my greatest success is just being able to maintain that um, <clears throat> and and have the lifestyle that real estate has afforded us. Biggest failure um, is probably just going back to what we were just discussing is sometimes not knowing when to turn it off. Working from home, I work from home a lot, and so it's easy to just be in that mode where I'm available and on mm -hmm. the clock 24 seven, instead of turning it, turning it off and actually being present and interacting with you know the wife and kids, which right. is way more important. So um, setting those boundaries, I think is probably been one of my biggest weaknesses that I'm improving. Yeah. working on still. So no, that's great. That's amazing. So when you first started out, that was kind of, uh, did you find you had that problem as far as like uh, the boundary wise uh, before you had your, your license or after did this kind of got worse or what was the, or is it kind of been the same? Long yeah, I would say probably about the same. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a little bit more with the agent stuff. Yeah. But that, again, that's kind of hit and miss. It's not it's always super consistent, but um, I guess that's just added to it, Yeah, you could say. But yeah, it's been fairly consistent. That's awesome. Cool. Uh, do you, what is your, what do, what do you see yourself going from here on? So you've been doing fix and flips, wholesaling, you're a real estate agent, you had rentals. Um, do you see yourself going in the same, just keep on going as, as and just keep doing more and more business or, or what do you see yourself, go, what's, what's going to happen in five years from, for that? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I've actually spent a lot of time thinking about that the last few months as, you know, 2020 is now here and where I want my business to go, where I want my career to go. And I've realized as much as, as, as exciting as it is to make, you know, 30, 40, $50,000 paychecks, once you get that paycheck, you've got to start over again. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so focusing more on the cash flow side, you know, I'll probably not get super excited about a single family home rental that's making me $300 a month. But uh, so for that reason, I'm actually pushing more towards developing, partnering with developers, um, doing multifamily deals. We closed on a deal in downtown Ogden that should allow us to build a 32 unit apartment building. I was the buying agent awesome. on that and just a small equity partner in that deal, but that will you know, once that's up and going, that will definitely help generate some cash flow. And so we're, I've got a few more potential deals in the pipeline that will allow us to build um, apartment buildings. And um, I'm wanting to get more into the commercial side of things, whether it's retail, storage units, things that where, you know, instead of focusing on a $100,000 property that will cash flow $300 a month, let's buy, you know, let's partner with people that have the funds and let's buy multi-million dollar properties that will generate a couple hundred thousand dollars of cash flow, yeah. you know, on an annual basis. So I'd rather much be a part of those types of deals than managing my own single family home for $300 a month. So just, I guess, uh, looking at the bigger picture and what's, you know, rather than thinking small, thinking much bigger and realizing that every building that's around us, whether how, whether how big or small it is, somebody owns it and somebody's likely making money from it. So right. why not me? Exactly. I like that. Why not me? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people get stuck in this like, well, I, I can never do something like that, yeah. you know, or it's too big. I'm just going to stick to my single family homes or whatever it is. But yeah, I think the uh, the biggest, like, why not me? Why not in anything, you know, do multifamily and I spent a year just working on multifamily. With that. And, and that was uh, one of the, one of my mentors, he said that like, why not you? Why, why can't you do this? You know, like, well, you're right. Why not? I mean, there's, there's no reason why not. I mean, yeah. smart. I'm, not, a, not an idiot. Well, sometimes um, <laughs> we'll have our moments. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, but but yeah, I think that's uh, it's important for everyone to really kind of realize that the, the limitations that we that we have is are, are self imposed. I think once you're in it too, uh, once you've done flips or once you've done a, a, like the single family home, like for instance, maybe that's what your goal was at the beginning, and then you're in it and you're like, this isn't for me. So I think sometimes it just takes. You trying different things to find what it is that you like and what your what your niche is going to be, because mm -hmm. you, you can have certain goals at the beginning and that's what you're trying to achieve. But once you're there, your goals can change, and so then that's when you start figuring out what what it is that you want to do. Yeah. Like so now you've you've had that under your belt. Now you your next. So is it a goal for 2020 to go steer towards more of the commercial side? Yeah, yeah. I want to definitely incorporate that into my business this year. So I want to close 50 transactions in 2020. 
And that's a combination of you know agent deals and also my own investment deals. But 50 transactions and and acquire 100 doors, whether that's storage unit doors, whether that's multifamily doors, you know, want to, I mean, I've got a whopping five doors right now, so <laughs> 95, 95 to go. Yeah. That's great though. That's awesome. We're going to start somewhere. Yeah. And it's all going to be 2020, right? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It'd be fun if we came back uh, 2021 and did a little check. Yeah, yeah let's do it. Yeah. January yeah. 2020, you're coming back on. Yeah, help you be accountable. <laughs> He's like, yeah. dang it. <laughs> But on that on that subject, I mean, do, do you have uh, accountability partners? I mean, do you actually? Because a lot of people, I, I find when they do goals and, and, and ambitious and, and good goals, you know, whether it's losing weight or, or for business or whatever, but they don't really have any way to hold themselves accountable. So, do you have you do you have you put any of that in place? Maybe I don't know. Yeah, so I'm writing that down. It always helps, but uh, I'm uh, also part of a few mastermind groups that. You know, we can kind of help keep ourselves accountable. We do weekly goals, and uh, yeah, it's, so it's always good to, you know, have somebody to be accountable to. When I started going to the gym a couple of years ago, I had an accountability partner, and he it was basically a buy one get one free type membership. I could always bring a guest, and I knew he couldn't get into the gym if I wasn't there at like five thirty, six o'clock in the morning. So I was like, gosh. <laughs> I've, got to, I've got to be there. I can't just let. I just can't like leave him hanging. If he shows up to the gym and I'm not there, he can't get in. So anyway, that was uh, that. That was a good starting point, I think, for what helped teach me accountability and how how impactful it was to have like whether it's your spouse or a friend or whatever business partner to help keep you accountable to going. Right. Whether it's to the gym or making phone calls or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's smart. I, I, and and. Uh, I always have my wife kind of, she kisses me, she's very, she has no problem kicking me in the butt when I'm not, uh, where I'm not meeting my goals, but this is a good thing, right? I mean, right. just where, so uh, having someone in your corner, whether it's a mastermind, whether it's spouse, friend, whatever, and, and to hold, hold you accountable is really good. It's a smart. Yeah, my wife and I are big, uh, big believers in vision boards too. Mm -hmm. So we, we like to keep all that, you know, dream boards, vision boards, uh, we like to keep those goals where we can constantly see him and then she too is on the same page. She's got her own vision board and I've got mine, but if she knows what's on mine, she knows that she can help keep me accountable to, right. to what awesome. I'm shooting for. So so let me ask you another question. So let's okay. just say you go back in time, built the time machine, we were able to see the future of you and, and how many doors you had, all that fun stuff. Now we're gonna go back in time. So five years ago, if you could have 15 minutes to talk to Devin that just barely bought this, he's just barely started wanting to go into real estate education. What would you tell him? What, what word of advice would you tell yourself? It's worth it. It's worth it? <laughs> yeah, okay. it's worth it. Um, but uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, don't, don't be afraid to go big. Don't settle. Um, you know, if other, if other people can do it, why not me? Yeah. So. I think just more motivation than anything, because I, uh, obviously I, over the last five years I've slowly gotten to where I am now, and yeah. I'm I'm happy, but I'm not content. If that makes sense. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, just motivation. Just like just the assurance of knowing it's gonna what's gonna work out, right? Right. So, do you have uh, uh, any anything you want to share to our listeners um, that would maybe a word of advice or anything at all that kind of would would help them um, see the motivation. Yeah, I would definitely them. I would definitely recommend um, being a part of groups that are networking, offering education. To, no matter what, whether it's real estate or something else, find something where you can find um, education, mentors, coaches, and surround yourself with the type of people that you want to be like. Take advice from. Don't take advice from somebody that you're not willing to trade seats with you know like uh, oftentimes I'm the type of person like I unfortunately care too much what other people think but should I care what somebody thinks that's not even in my same boat or not where I want to be right. and so um, I actually listened to a motivational video this morning that talked about should wolves care about what sheep think I was like, <laughs> likely not you know right. so if uh, we and oftentimes that's unfortunately my weakness is I it's it's easy to get caught up in what other people think or might think and it's like freaking cares mm -hmm. yeah so anyway um yeah surround yourself with with people um that are where you want to be and then you'll definitely you know raise your mindset raise your action raise your 
goals, whatever, you know, to, to where they want to, to where they're at and to where you want to be. Yeah. So no, definitely. And I think that that's uh, pretty, pretty crucial. I mean, I've, I've heard this before, uh, I've said this before, your, your network is your net worth. Yeah. You know, sure. so it just, and, and, and they've done um, psychology studies uh, multiple times, proven in, in multiple different studies where um, your 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 uh, net your your income, health, attitude, just in general. If I if I found someone and I didn't know that person at all, but I was able to interview and ask a questionnaire of the five people that spend the most time with, I can average that all out, and I'll be very close to what that person really is on, on everything, like income, health. Uh, even attitude, all that stuff. Like it, that, it's it's what it is. So if you want to change yourself, change your surroundings, and that's yeah. how you change yourself. Yeah. Or mm-hmm. or uh, tribal uh, race. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. So we want to be with the same as, as other people. So that's cool. So uh, is how would I list if our list if any listener wanted to reach out to you? If you, I mean, is there any way that they can get a hold of you or? or yeah, I'm. Uh, whether it's good or bad, I'm on. I'm on social media quite a bit, <laughs> right. but uh, I'm on Instagram and uh, Facebook, and you can easily find me there. Um, my email is devinhubbard03 at gmail.com, and feel free to reach out to me there, but yeah, I'm always happy to you know go to lunch or interact and yep. work, yeah, for sure. So it's about the people, so that's what I enjoy. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, thanks for coming out to the podcast. We appreciate you. I mean, you uh, it's thanks for having me. It's incredible your, your your story from where you were and where you are now. It's just uh, it's it's inspirational for, at the very least. Well, thank you. So, appreciate that. No, I appreciate you coming out. So. We hope you liked that podcast. Stay tuned for next Monday for a brand new podcast and a brand new guest. Make sure to like, subscribe, and share.